So welcome to Dose of Deborah Rehab for the Heart. I'm your host, Dr. Deb Howell. Today, my guest is Zesis. And Zesis is a conscious teacher, a heart math trainer, a heart imagery meditation facilitator. And he is also um, has a group with called uh, Divine Masculine Roundtable. Right. Yeah. Is that mm-hmm. correct? Yeah. yeah. So um, welcome, Z. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you again for the invite and the opportunity to see what again comes out because it's been really magical for me and talking to us who which he couldn't join today but i'm hoping he can join us next time um he found it incredible uh magical as well yeah and you know these conversations that allow us to reflect and hear each other but hear ourselves you know um and, and what we want to do with that is to have others listen and gain perspective because I, all of it really is about perspective. Our perspective and our beliefs are sort of all intertwined. And when we have, when we have a subject matter that opens to our very core you know, that most sensitive and vulnerable space within us. And the discussion that we started was around love, right? Like the, um, what does that look like? And how do we learn, learning how to love ourselves. And as, as as a man, how does that process begin when oftentimes men are, I, I guess, conditioned into not showing so much emotion and especially for yourself, right? To, to tune in and, and to really be present with yourself. And it's that whole process usually comes about after something that has been painful versus we're going along in life and everything is you know but it's when we hit up against some pain and some real um questions about life and and what does it all mean right so today i wanted to ask you because the subject was brought up um about the battle within right and men or women, we, we all go through our own inner dialogue and questioning ourselves, our self-worth, all that. But when it comes to learning how to go in and, you know, have that self-inquiry, and yet we're, we're meeting with conflict, we're, we're meeting with our own inner conflict. Right. Regardless of what's going on on the outside, the, the inside, the challenge to believe ourselves, right? So I, I wanted you to kind of, from a male perspective, speak to challenges with loving yourself, learning to love yourself. Yeah, it's a lot to unpack. So... Um... Yeah, that's a load. There's two parts that I was kind of um, holding on to. One, uh, a virtue of your manhood or your womanhood is is the virtue of your of your of of you being a child. Everything that we learn, and I think we've covered some of this in in the first uh, talk that we have, in my opinion, anyways, is the virtue of your growing up first seven years, first 14 years are the, really the foundation of how you are taught to be resilient, to shape perspective, to overcome, to be positive, to be loving, to be loving to oneself, right? 
um, I look at my own son and I think um, men in different stages in their, uh, and when I say that, it's like men, culture has shifted in the way that men have allowed to express themselves. I think there was a, a massive shift with, um, I believe it was John Irving with Iron Man, Iron, Iron John, started that whole process of un, for men to start unpacking and get the emotional context out and start healing that those wounds. And prior to that, men, men don't cry, they don't express emotion, you know, you toughen up and I led to a lot of suicides, continues to lead to a lot of suicides as far as I'm concerned, as far as men goes. Um, Cause it's not really a validation of, of their core and it doesn't have to be men, it's women in general. When you, when you, when you refrain from expressing your authenticity, the trueness of who you are, there is a, a conflict within oneself. So your adult life is an expression of your of your childhood, I, I would say. So learning to love oneself is really learning to heal the wounds in your childhood. And um, I don't care what anyone says. You know, people can say, I've had incredible, beautiful childhood. There's something there for somebody, for everybody. It could be the most benign thing that you weren't aware of that kind of leads into something that you just, you pull that string and everything else collapses. So I think for me, it's always been a journey of going back and um, meticulously going back and, um, and assessing what are those wounds that need to be healed? What is that shadow that I haven't uh, put light on that needs to have light on? And that takes courage. This isn't something that, and I suspect that's why most don't actually take this journey because of the courage it, it takes, because it does begin to, um, begins to unpack the emotional content. If you experienced the one, whatever that emotional content is, reliving it again is always much more powerful, right? It's like you were there to begin with and the refrain again from experiencing that. But every time you experience it, you, you, you minimize the emotional power of that one's head on you. At least that's been for me. And over time where you, where you can make amends and, and, and heal and, um, allow that to be and, and, and witness it for what it is, because in the end, that that incident had had served you in a way that you yourself may not have been aware of at the time. And it's having that perspective. So the, the beginning of the self-love is really getting into a deeper dive of your truer expression, is what I would say. So I, I think... Um some of the things that may get in the way and you mentioned suicide and that's that's very extreme so expectations shame failure a sense of failure mm. right disappointment and you know different examples come to me when you know, one was a physician's son who was a medical student, took his life. Now, I would question why would he take his life? Because was that path of medicine his path or a path that was chosen for him? And in order to speak to what he wanted, he didn't have that option to do so without the possibility of disappointing or feeling, you, you, okay, you're gonna let someone down or there might be pressures, right? There's, yeah. there yes. are pressures that come from parents to children in the way that a, a child making a decision on their career is not based on what they want, but based on what is expected of them. And then when you can't speak to it, you're, you're sort of like, you, you're, you're swallowed up and you don't feel that there's a way out. And 
you know, so that's a, that's a, that's a burden that is carried. And for men in roles as a provider, right? Right. Typically that the, that expectation of protector provider, right? Puts them in a place that they have to be strong, right? Yeah. Physically strong, like mentally strong like they could just handle it but yet there's they have within themselves like i want to be seen i want to be heard and that's just not happening so and that is a that is an issue that is a real issue and i know of more than one situation where this led to not necessarily suicide, but depression, uh, parents disowning their child because the child did not choose the path that they wanted for them. So, so then if, right, here's the other flip side. So the, the child made a decision as an adult to take a different path. And then the parents are like, well, you know, so they keep distance as a means to, um, it, it's a, I don't know if it's a conscious form of punishment, but it's, it's punishment. And so where does love fit into that when we are wanting something from our children that is not in their heart to do? And as a male, who is not expected to cry, <laughs> is not expected to really show this level of vulnerability and sensitivity because it's deemed as weak, right? And it's well, not I'm, I'm going to level with you. Uh, the people that know me, I cry a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly, yeah. perfectly um, okay with uh, showing my expression because it is a reflection of who I am. And um, the fact that I'm allowing these emotions to come out in, in someone's presence, a stranger or otherwise, um, I think has a deep reverence for, for me anyways, of, of, of the space that's being held at that point in time. You know, because I think the moment that, yeah, have you ever been in a room where, um, you know, I've been in many rooms actually where somebody shared a story with me, you know, or us as an audience. And that story was incredibly vulnerable, right? They didn't have to share that story. But the moment that they shared that story, I had so much passion, so, so much love, so much, you know, it, it brought out that part of me, right? And that's what we need, need to start doing more is trusting our, our fellow human beings and allowing that vulnerability. Um, maybe our past have shown has shown us that uh, if you do that, maybe experiences, I don't know, but if you do that, this is what the punishment is for. And maybe this is why people don't do that. But I think there's so many rewards connecting is when you do that, I think you connect at the deepest part of one, one's heart. You really have a true heart connection at that point in time. Ultimately, you know, wanting to get into our own, accepting who we are and with all you know, without judgment and without shaming ourselves or any any blame to be in the picture, any of those things, or, or feeling guilty. So ultimately, that place to validate what we feel and acknowledge the emotions that we feel, because this, this is where things get bottled up. This is where, you know, if we don't feel appreciated, and, and and things can sort of escalate, right? Um, and and mainly it's it's because that's that becomes a means of uh, expression, right? That is not controlled. That has taken on a instinctive quality, a reactive quality. Mm. And, and that does not truly reveal who we are. It, it just shows that we are human beings that have 
reactive tendencies <laughs> and when things are when we're under feeling under pressure right pressure and you're going to do what's what's familiar to you and if there's if there's no practice if there's no if around you if your environment does not accept like crying or accept conversation right A around emotions that have you saying i'm sad you know and i don't know like really just dropping into and being okay with not knowing right versus feeling like you always have to have the answers and you always have to be the be on and then and so but a lot of that is the internalization of what we do with that, right? Yeah, there are other people who can be on the outskirts to say things, but then when we internalize and make it the truth for ourselves, that, that's when it that's when it's alive in us, right? It, it's in us. And so, but for Mal, um, I was gonna ask you, you said that, you know, crying is, it just comes for you. Has it always been that way or did you? Oh, no, no, no. Kind of, no. yeah. So, so how about that? Like, how did that, where did you, because that's the whole point. Like when folks right now, if, if they are not, they're like, uh-uh, that, that's, that's not me, right? No. So uh, maybe it's a, it's a virtue of me aging. I don't know, but you know, when I was a young man, um, certainly those those precepts were drilled into my head, especially coming from a European background. You just don't show that weakness, period. And it's only when I started doing my own self-discovery work and um, just sitting with, with who I am. Who, who am I? Well, what's my purpose here, right? When I'm sitting with that and uncovering... Um, all the things that I have uncovered, it, it, the the crying was the, the physical manifestation of the emotional release. So the moment I released that physically, that emotion was released with that as well. So for me, that's the relationship. That's the that's the neuronal uh, connection that I have with crying in now because, and I allow it freely because that's that's the emotion that it means. That's charged for me. That's that's an emotional charge. That sits within my cells and my fascia and my and my and my muscles and and it sits there and it's reverberating and it has energy and um, this is what in my view disease is when a lot of these thoughts manifest into emotional dysfunction allow to be in the body over long periods of time you get different manifestations of disease at least that's what I think yeah the, the body has the body contains information of our life experiences. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I would ask you though, was it something of an emotional experience that led you to your own reflection? Like, or did you decide this one day, okay, I'm going to sit and no, reflect no, no. <laughs> because that, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know what I mean? Like something usually is a catalyst for the, the like i need answers i need help i need like you, you just you're struggling you could be you're struggling right like because it's well, usually not until we're really in that place that um we can decide to kind of question our life right and what is our life all about and what is who are we, you know, to be in this world? Right. So if you're, if, if you're, I mean, I'm the type of person that I've always been a person of self-discovery and always looking for the um, higher purpose in life, as long as I can remember. And I got to a certain point where I felt like any of the work that I've done, I could do, I've done it. And anything that was my impediment, I couldn't see it. I had the blinders on. I couldn't, 
you know, take that option. So that's where therapeutic work went in, had a third party through many multiple conversations kind of reflect on some of the things that I'm kind of missing. So it started there, that, that unpacking started there. And the healing started there as well. That was the beginning process for me. So from a relationship, was there, because again, a lot of these things, it's not until there's some like direct thing that says, hey, wait a minute, like this is not, you know, usually with respect to someone or something that makes us take a look, right? It, it's, it, it's beyond a nudge. It could be like, okay, I, I got like something's going on. And so with relation to something, right? Because we're not typically seeking to make changes in our life if we don't have any issues with <laughs> what's going on right so something has to be like you know all right i'm unhappy or i'm i feel unfulfilled or discontent or you know s- something is is stoking that right. um, inquiry so is was there like was that with respect to something that got your attention to um, initially especially since you said like this was not how you were raised to be this is you weren't raised to be show emotions and and just you came to understand that that was a natural part of who you are but so but there's a gap between then and there right so right i, I people will fall in the, in the gap. <laughs> it's like, get them on the raft. Like, can we get on the raft? How did you get on that raft to sail across to where you're at to begin to show that? So, so what's the onboarding piece? Like how does, what would you suggest would be helpful for someone to sort of um, if they're in a struggle right now, because typically that's, that's what's going to well, lead people to think. So um, if you're in a struggle right now and you're listening to this, the best advice I can give anyone is to be in the company of other like-minded people like you. Um, the worst thing that you can do is isolate yourself and completely disassociate from life in general, because that, uh, contorts the reality even further, especially with the, the landscape that you may be holding at that point in time. So company of other individuals is the best thing. Laughter as well is incredible uh, balm for whatever needs to be healed at that point in time. And, you know, for me, it's always getting to a point of stability that then you can begin to look at what needs to be looked at. Thoughts are really important. The way you think is really important. And, you know, considering we have anywhere between 70 to 80 thoughts a day, the nature of those thoughts is what creates your reality and creates the emotional content on a day-to-day basis. And I'm willing to venture that most people, and I catch myself, um, thoughts tend to be more negative overwhelmingly more negative than positive or even neutral thoughts. You know, there's a, there's a, there's an association there as well. So if you want to do, if you want to do something right now, or if you want to do less of something right now is being more in neutral thought or, uh, or, you know, I think positive thought is, is um, uh, it's been overstated. I, I tend to go to more of neutral thought because it focuses on the present moment and what needs to be done and um, and um, acknowledges what has been done in the past that got you here to rectify what needs to be moved forward in the future. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, so asking for help, being given yourself permission to to feel whatever you feel. I mean, it's so important that that be a starting point that we give ourselves permission to feel. 
whatever it is you feel, because we're all with this inner child, every one of us. Right. And, and, and that's just it, what it is. Like, believe it or not, that's just what it is. <laughs> we all have an inner child. And, and so acknowledging that there is that place in us that feels frightened, that feels uncertain, that feels alone, that, you know, and is, huh? It wants to be acknowledged. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so for whatever it is that's showing up and, you know, it's important to give yourself permission to feel, and then know that it's okay to ask for help and, you know, look to ask for help from the people or that, you know, you trust. And if it's in a crisis situation, there are crisis hotlines that definitely, you know, are important to seek out because yeah. this is important. And if like what you said, if you isolate yourself and all the chatter and things that go on in our own mind that we can, you know, get all convoluted and and just further spiral into a place that is that can be really unhealthy and you know to the point where someone feels like the only way out is to like you know check out completely and and that is not what we're talking about to that degree is because we can get to a place where we say I need help you know, be okay with saying, I need help, right? That takes, and, and that takes real strength to do that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfectly, uh, yeah. perfectly fine to ask for help. Yeah, yeah. And, and so speaking from, you know, a male perspective, I, I just, it, it's important that men recognize that they have love that is within them to be honored and revered like you know um and our own acknowledgement of that that love that's in us right i i I think from a male perspective it is our duty to um how can i put this not only share our love but be the love in the world. And I think as, as, a, as women, it's not only accepting it, but to also radiate it as well. Um, I think that's the combined role of the divine feminine masculine. So being around other men like you who are willing to hold space for other men to show up and to be present to themselves and, and have a, an environment and other men that will have them um, just openly, non-judgmentally, just uh, be available to them, you know? Um, where can people connect with you? Because that's, that's where you are. Um, that's where your heart is, is to reach out to men. Right, and uh, right now uh, it's the YouTube channel that uh, I'm holding all the uh, Divine Masculine uh, Roundtables at. It's the Elevate Me Academy YouTube page. And through there, if you want to reach out, uh, there's a, an email that you can email me with. The, we are also in the process of holding and creating a digital and a physical uh, uh, circle of healing for men. We'll wait to see what COVID comes out. Hopefully summertime, it won't be, maybe it will, maybe it won't. We'll wait to see, but we're creating the, the space nonetheless. Because I think, you know, and I'm not trying to single out only, only men here. I just feel like what I'm built to do is for men, though it can be done for women as well. That, that's not, the, that's not the, the issue. I've just, I just, I feel for me and what I'm here to do is to create that space for men because when men begin to heal, then women can begin to lead and they can begin to lead as well, to, to heal as well. Yeah. Well, you know, we're all in this world together. And I think that um, 
men are just as, as sensitive, if not more, I think sometimes, right? Than than women, we it's just uh, it's just not given the the permission to to be outwardly displayed, right? In in I'm I'm talking not in the this this kind of uh, you know sensitivity this raw, <laughs> but like a sensitivity that's tender, right? That's what I'm talking about. A sensitivity that's genuinely tender that uh well, and honoring that space you know right. bar i've right. heard a lot of conversations or stories where men tend to get to that point and women don't honor that and vice versa right it's honoring the space that you know that vulnerable space that we tend to get in when we are asking for help but to truly honor that space and i think that's part of the other issue is that we don't know how to hold space for people because mm. we ourselves are are not whole ourselves and you know when someone starts to let go of some deep personal stuff like oh my god what do i do with this how do i be <laughs> yeah I, I would say is like just someone just they just need you to listen without judgment mm -hmm. without coming back they just want you to listen that's it yeah yeah and you know feeling accepted and and heard is uh heard. Yeah. yeah, I think all of us, Deborah. I think all of us need to be seen and heard in some yes. way, shape, or form. That's the the source of all conflict. Yeah, and listening to ourselves in a kinder, in a much kinder way. <laughs> you know, because we yeah. judgment, criticism, we can be really good at that. So um, we can learn some new ways to. Be with ourselves and be able to hold space and be with others so you know and that's actually harder it's much easier to be negative because of everything that we consume right i think our environment is what dictates how we begin to think of ourselves in relation to other things and how we bring that forward so you know simplify life is what i would say you know Stop watching TV. Stop reading things that feed the, the negativity, right? Um, be around positive people and positive things. Uh, feed your soul in that way, and things will things naturally turn around. Yeah. And, and our, our nature is love, and yet our instinctive nature is to protect, and we're wired for, you know, gauging our environment yeah. right and so the nervous system is already set up to look out for us in that way so this is a conscious decision to go in and to you know reflect because the rest of it we're on autopilot <laughs> we are so um yeah but I, I appreciate this conversation and and we can continue this conversation uh so you know just uh, it, it's important that that folks know that there is room to explore and there are people who are willing and um available to take that time and uh hang out with you so yeah. you know absolutely you're one of those folks see and if anyone wants to connect with me I'm on Facebook, Dr. Deb Howell, and my I have a podcast, Dose of Deborah Rehab for the Heart, and you know, and Instagram too, Dose of Deborah. But I appreciate you, Z, and you know, your openness and your sincerity. Um, you know, these conversations are are important to have. You know. And we, we need, we all need to start having more of these conversations, yeah. you know, in yeah. one way, shape, strangers among strangers. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. So many, you know, we're one, one big human family and it's time that we got to know each other a little more intimately, let's say. Yeah. Well, you know, we are more alike than we want to acknowledge at times. So, and the whole 
our whole history has been focused on all the dissimilarities than all the similarities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think yep. um, we're learning so much from that. And I really would like to see a future where we, we're celebrating our similarities and respecting things that may not, we may not agree with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can agree to disagree and, and be Absolutely. civil and, um, but to know, have an open frame and have the curiosity mm -hmm. as a child. Like, why is it like this? I really, mm -hmm. really understand why. You know? uh, and I, when, I, when I adopt that kind of frame for me, I learn so much. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There, there's, there, there's so much to these conversations. And um, I have many, many stories. <laughs> so. okay. Next time when you connect, you'll have to tell us a story. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, well, listen, have a wonderful evening and I uh, look forward to connecting again. And, um, you know, so I and I hope that folks who are listening will find value with this and uh, reach out. OK, um, we're here for you. Thank you, Deborah. Enjoy your evening and Thank looking you, forward yeah. to the next connection. Yeah, same here. You too. OK. Peace,